Let's pray. Father God, take my spoken words. May they accurately reflect the written word. And may they lead us to faith in the living word. Your Son, Jesus. Amen. A while ago, a guy came into the church looking for me when I wasn't around, either because it was a day off or because it was like doing something else. But he left his email address. And so I sent him a message saying I'd heard he was looking for me, sorry I'd missed him, but if he replied with a time which suited them, I'd endeavour to ensure that I was around and available. But his response took me a bit by surprise. He came back saying, sorry, that's not good enough. Jesus didn't force people to make appointments. I wrote back saying, well, sorry you feel that way. But my offer still stands. If you want to make an appointment, I'll, I'll make time to see you. And the meeting never happened. He never did get back to me. It's a fact of life that no matter how hard you try, you will let people down occasionally. You can't please all the people all the time. And sometimes it's not because of anything you've done or not done. Sometimes the expectations placed upon you are either unrealistic or unfair. Maybe sometimes those expectations are more imagined than real. But sometimes we can face real but unfair expectations. And sometimes... We allow those expectations or ideas to be thrust on us. A common struggle that many people face is a difficulty in saying, no, we're nice. We like to be helpful. We like to be liked. We like to be needed. And we don't like disappointing others. And so we can find ourselves saying yes and maybe regretting it later. And maybe in Christian circles this can be made worse. You know, we read lots of passages about serving others, about the greatest among us being the servant of all, about considering others' needs greater than our own, about what you do for the least of them you do for me. And all of that is good and true. I stand by it. And we can also live with this idea that Jesus was always there for everyone, therefore so should we be. Or Jesus was always happy to take that interruption, therefore so should we be. And again it feels persuasive because it contains a certain amount of truth. Some of the great scenes and stories in the Gospels come because Jesus did deal with that interruption. Or in my duck talk this morning, I spoke about Jesus making time for all sorts of different people. But that approach comes with a risk. Because you can reach the point where there is something that's truly important to you. But you can't do it because you're already overcommitted. Or you have nothing left to offer. Because all your energy and resources are being invested somewhere else. Being invested in things which aren't necessarily bad. They may even be really good things. But they're not really where your heart lies. And that's why this morning's passage is quite liberating. It's one of those situations where the expectations of others are thrust upon Jesus. And Jesus just pushes them right back. It's one of those times when Jesus says no. And if even Jesus can say no, maybe there's times that it's good and right and proper for us to do so and do it without guilt. This story comes at the end of a rather breathless section of the gospel. It was the first Sabbath after Jesus had called four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James and John, to drop everything and become his disciples. And we've already described the scene with the ducks. You know, we start off in the synagogue to the house of Peter and Andrew where, they he, where he heals Peter's mother-in-law to a day where he's healing all sorts of sick and injured people. Jesus is constantly giving out. 
But in the midst of all the clamour for his attention, Jesus seems calm, unflustered, controlled. Which is quite in contrast to what happens next, because the next section is filled with anxiety. You know, sometimes I wonder just how sick Capernaum must have been. Jesus has spent the whole of the previous evening healing all sorts of different people. But by dawn the next morning, there's another load at Peter's door. But Jesus, he's nowhere to be seen. And I sometimes imagine Peter, Andrew, James and John looking at one another and thinking, you know, what are we supposed to do now? Well, I don't know. Why you, you know that. What are you asking me for? I, I haven't got a clue. I'm new to this too. And there's a sense of verse 36 and verse 36 and 37 of them looking for him, finding him, and exclaiming. There's this nervousness, there's frustration, a sense of urgency of what are you doing? Do you not know everyone's looking for you? Why are you wasting your time out here alone, all that praying and meditating, when there's lots of work to be done back home? It's not going to do itself. Maybe they had this sense that Jesus was going to launch something major in Capernaum. Part of them was probably thinking, oh, this won't do our reputation or status in the community any harm. Jesus had really built up great expectations. Who knows what could happen next? Except Jesus doesn't respond. As they expect. Let's go somewhere else. To the other village. So as I can preach there too. That's why I've come. All those crowds. Waiting. Expecting. All that good. Just sitting there waiting to be done. And Jesus walks away. Jesus says no what on earth is going on well there are three thoughts i want to leave with you this morning they're not especially new i'm sure i've shared these ideas with you before but they bear repeating because we do so easily lose sight of them Sometimes the thing that gets in the way of giving God the best of us is not the bad. Sometimes the enemy of the best is the good. You might experience something like this. I I know I do. You regularly get letters from various charitable organisations seeking your support. I get them quite a bit at home, but but I can sometimes get several a week at the church. And there's one simple truth. I believe God calls us to generosity. I seek to live up to it. But the simple truth is, I cannot help them all. And you too are a finite resource. We can be pulled in all sorts of directions. Lots of things clamoring for our attention. Many of them good, perhaps really good. But perhaps there is something that God is seeking you to be involved in. A passion that he's stirring within you. But it can be really easy to be distracted from pursuing it. And it won't necessarily be something bad that blows you off course. That would be too obvious. You'd probably spot that. However, we can be overwhelmed by the good. There is so much need in our world and we cannot meet it all. So many people needing our help, doing so many good things and we can't do them all. But put a number of our things, which are not bad, perhaps even good, perhaps even perfectly godly things in our path. And it might just suck enough of our time and energy away to stop us doing what God really wants for us. We're a busy generation. Okay, maybe for some of you it hasn't been as busy in the last few months, but how many conversations have you had where you've asked or been asked how it's going and the first response has included the word busy. 
And it may be all good, worthy stuff keeping you busy. But we're, when we're in that position, there's always the risk that it gets in the way of us doing what God really wants us to do. And that was the temptation facing Jesus. Mark doesn't talk about Jesus going away to pray that much. Luke focuses on Jesus' prayer life more than Mark does. But when Mark does talk about Jesus withdrawing to pray, it's normally at a key moment. Perhaps staying in Capernaum was a real temptation. There were people who needed him there. He could achieve so much good. He already had. Look at the difference he was making already. And that was what they wanted. It was what his disciples expected. But Jesus wasn't prepared to be defined by that. Because he knew and was committed to what God wanted of him. He knew what he had to say yes to. And that gave him permission to say no. But it's not just that the good can be the enemy of the best. The urgent can become the enemy of the important. One of our major problems as people is that we struggle to tell the difference between those two things. The urgent and the important. I'm conscious of this in my own life. Small scale. There are times I know I've got a really busy day ahead. So as I'm making the coffee in the morning, I think, oh, I'll just send off that email. And then I open the emails and discover there's one waiting from someone who was up later than I was the previous evening. So I think, oh, I'll just answer that. But as I do that, I suddenly remember, oh, yeah, I was supposed to order something for Sunday service. I keep forgetting. I'll just do it whilst it's in my head. And so I'm on to Amazon. And if I'm not careful, I'm getting slowly sucked into all sorts of stuff that's clamoring for my attention. And I'm a person who often underestimates how long something's going to take me. You know, I've started to get behind and I might have added more to my to-do list that I've checked off. I've got someone coming to see me, so I'd better get ready. And I haven't had time to stop and pray. And if that happens for a few days, I really start to feel it. The urgent gets in the way of the important. And because the important is being neglected, in time even the urgent starts to suffer. Or on a much grander scale, there's something that you felt called to. That best thing that we've already spoken about. But there's always something more pressing that stops us getting away. We keep waiting for the right time. The truth is, there never will be a right time. There will always be a reason not to. There will be always something pressing, something more urgent. The urgent screams for our attention. The important just sits there quietly waiting for us to catch up. And that's why the urgent gets in the way of the important. And perhaps for Jesus there was that temptation. He knew he had to move on. It was time to get on with what God was calling him to. Jesus, there's pressing need right here, right now. Why not just stay another day? What day? What difference can a day make? But would it be any different then? Would the demands just keep coming? And even within the passage, there's a hint that Jesus knew of that struggle. When the disciples find Jesus and say, everyone's looking for you, Jesus says, let's go somewhere else so that I can preach there also. That's why I've come out. And often it's assumed that Jesus is talking big scale about why he's come into the world. But it may be more basic than that. Maybe Jesus is saying, this is why I've come out here, away from the village. Because I knew they'd be waiting for me. I knew if I didn't get away early, there'd be crowds waiting for me this morning. And I knew if I stayed another day, it would be the same day tomorrow and the day after that. There would never be a good time to move on. There would always be the urgent. 
It's always going to get away in the way of the important. So sometimes the good can get in the way of the best. And the urgent can get in the way of the important. And because of that, we struggle to say yes and no at the right moments. There is a lot of pain in the world. And together we are called to meet it. But note that word. Together. None of us is called to do it all. The position of saviour of the world isn't vacant. It's already been taken. There is a Redeemer, and it's not you. But we do each have a part to play. And in Christ we can sometimes say no without guilt. The more important question is, what are we saying yes to? And for many of us, that is a more basic problem. Often we don't know what that best or important is. We find it hard to tell amongst the demands and the clamour of the good and the urgent. And I'm afraid there's no shortcut. Jesus could recognise the important from the best because he took time to be alone in prayer. He created the space for stillness and silence into which he could let God speak. And it was because of that that Jesus was free to say no without guilt. Because he knew what he was saying yes to. He was able to do that because he got himself alone and stuck at it. It enabled him to listen to and understand the needs around him. But it also empowered him not to let that run his life. Because he knew what God wanted him to do. Because he listened to his life. Jesus says, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. If what we're asking for or seeking is the important and the best that God has for us, trust me, the doors will open. That's a prayer God is only too willing to answer. But there is no shortcut. There is no substitute. And that's not to say you won't occasionally disappoint others or feel that you've let someone down. I'm afraid that's life. And it's not to say you'll never do stuff that's really not your thing. Sometimes we have to. But if you know what the best and what the important is, then you become aware of the resources that you have to answer the calls of the good and the urgent. And you'll be living a healthier life because it's closer to who God created you to be. So may you create and find the still space into which the Spirit can speak. May you find yourself able to recognise the important from the urgent and the best from the good. May you learn when to say no without guilt because you know the calling that God has placed upon you. You know what you're here for. And you've learned the right time to say yes. Grace and peace to you. Amen.